Welcome back to This Is Your Country with Paige Willie. I am so delighted to welcome my guest on today. We have Molly Hemingway, the editor-in-chief of The Federalist, senior journalism fellow at Hillsdale College and a Fox News contributor. She is the co-author of the national bestseller Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Supreme Court, and the author of the bestseller Rigged, How the Media, Big Tech, and Democrats Seized Our Elections. Hemingway is the 2021 recipient of the Bradley Prize. Molly, welcome to the show. I'm so delighted to have you on. I'm very happy to be here with you. So I really wanted to bring you on prior to the midterm elections because this, you are not just an expert in how the transparently partisan actors affect our elections, but how even institutions of government and the media institutions work to deprive Americans of a voice and to, um, to influence election outcomes in a way that is completely improper and sometimes illegal. So your work and your reporting and The Federalist itself, uh, which is an enormously important outlet, uh, cultivates this huge audience of highly engaged, well-informed readers. Um, It's at the nexus of exposing how these media actors and the unaccountable government actors uh, in the bureaucracies, in the intelligence community, Uh, They weaponize power to deprive citizens of a voice and of recourse. And so when Biden delivers these types of speeches like he did just a few days ago about quote unquote democracy and extremism and all of these types of things where he uses these epithets and these smears to delegitimize half of the country's voters, uh, it's obvious to people listening that he means uh, to that his view is that it is problematic to have electoral outcomes that give representation to Republican voters, period. That's why they hate President Trump. That's why they hate Governor DeSantis. And you have been one of the most important voices um, sort of studying the worst scenarios in the past few years where these unelected entities have tried to control election outcomes and where the elected entities have tried to uh, work to consolidate power so that Republican voters cannot have a voice. And so one of the Uh, really key ways in which they were doing this was, of course, the Russiagate hoax. And in my mind, this was an attempt to usurp the will of the people that hamstrung President Trump's first term, saw this firsthand in the White House. Investigations of this nature are, in my mind, used to cast aspersions and delegitimize politicians that the intelligence community doesn't like. And they're also used to distract whichever the elected official is and sort of paralyze them, derail their productive government activity, wasting valuable time needed to govern. So basically, in my mind, this this investigation was used to interfere with the mandate with which President Trump was elected to enact sweeping disruptive policy changes to disrupt the establishment's business as usual. As a major journalist exposing this topic as a fraud perpetrated on the public right from the beginning, can you walk through how you even knew where to start unwinding the thread with the Russia hoax situation? Well, first off, I just want to say you're absolutely right that this was a massive um, intervention against the will of the American people, and it was horrible what was done. It was so interesting because you remember during the 2016 campaign, the corporate media and other elements of the regime promised people there was no way that President Trump could win. And they did all of the normal things you do against a Republican, but just sort of like in a much more dramatic fashion. And when he won, they should have, you know, if the media were in any way a respectable or competent institution, you would have expected them to think deeply about why they had gotten the story wrong, how little they understood the American people and what the significance of that was. And instead, they glommed on to Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee's like absurd conspiracy theory that Donald Trump had stolen the 2016 election. And then, as you know, these unaccountable bureaucrats weaponized this absurd conspiracy theory to try to destroy and undermine, you know, a duly elected presidency. And it had profound effect on the country, on the world even, because it affected foreign policy. And the I will just say the reason why I knew that to be suspicious about it right at the beginning. And it was very difficult to be suspicious because in a corporate media environment, everybody immediately glommed onto this. But um, I think my thing was, I knew people who had voted for Donald Trump and they weren't affected by Russia. They had really rational, easy to understand reasons for voting for him. And so when people would say, the only way this makes sense is if 
Russia intervened, I would think, or Hillary Clinton's a bad candidate and Donald Trump has some really exciting policy proposals that people like. You know, there has been so much failure from the from the regime, whether it was uh, interventionist wars without a clear focus or plan for winning, or whether it was, you know, the financial bailouts that had bothered so many people left and right, where everybody had to bail out these large corporations and then they, you know, didn't have to pay for any of their problems, whether it was the border that the elites had claimed, you know, there was nothing you could do about. Anytime the elites were put in charge of something, they just really messed it up and people were sick of it. And so I just had like a different theory of why Donald Trump won. And then I actually am very blessed to have sat in, it was before I worked at Fox and I was at a different, it was I was doing a commentary at a different cable outlet and some of the people who ha- who were running the Russia collusion hoax from the media side kind of accidentally revealed to me who some of their sources were on the bureaucrat side. And so I just knew and had confidence early on. Unfortunately, I couldn't report it because it was, you know, one of these things that you're not supposed to report things that happen off air. But I just had a confidence. And that confidence was important because I even had like a Republican senator do an intervention with me to tell me that he was pretty sure this stuff was true and I was going to make a fool out of myself. And it was very difficult to have that kind of pressure from different people. But I had confidence because these these uh, these media people had sort of messed up and accidentally revealed the plot. Oh, my goodness. Well, in addition to hearing that troubling information that you were not able to report on because it was you know, given in a, a private context or whatever it was, what were some of the most problematic discoveries that you made while covering the Russia hoax that showed the government itself was working against the election of President Trump and then working to undermine his presidency um, after he won in 2016? And what was the role of these sort of nebulous actors like Mark Elias, who's this very high-powered Democratic lawyer who not only was very close with the, I forget what his exact role was with the the Hillary Clinton campaign, but he has since, um, and we can come to this later, um, become this really vociferous, nasty advocate um, against things like voter ID laws, anything he can do to dilute the franchise, to dilute proper elections. uh, That's what he's on as this very high-powered lawyer. So what was his role at that time? What was going on behind the scenes with all of these people working against President Trump? Yeah, he was Hillary Clinton's general counsel. He's and he's had such a history of being involved in elections on the bad side of things. You know, he was involved in that very suspiciously um improper Al Franken election in Minnesota that ended up having a uh, a lot of effect on Obamacare being passed. He was the guy who actually signed the checks of the Russia collusion hoax as Hillary Clinton's general counsel. And he also, you know, just helps out a lot of Democrats. And he also, yes, orchestrated the plant, the plot to take over the 2020 elections by changing hundreds of laws and processes. Um, so it was just, it. Was, I always view it as like there were three different groups involved in that hoax. Hillary Clinton and the Democrats cooked it up. The media regurgitated it. And the bureaucrats on the inside um, weaponized like the power they had. They could anonymously leak things to make it sound like things were bad. And they used and continue to use that power in their war against President Trump. And I do want to just take a little step back and point out the whole reason why President Trump was a threat was because he was doing that emperor has no clothes kind of routine on all these big issues, including He did not think that the foreign policy that we had sort of fallen into in recent decades made any sense. Uh, It's clearly supported by powerful people on both left and right uh, that does not put national security and national interest as its foremost concern. It has become this weird thing about democracy building, and it leads to massive expenditures of money bloodshed and no real good, you know, there's it's not like at the end of the day, you've got a really good result in Afghanistan or Iraq um, or other places where we practice this. Or, you know, every time we do a regime change, it usually involves replacing a really bad guy with a somehow horrifically worse guy, you know? And so he was saying things against that and that was a huge threat. And so it was, you know, they found it uh, an okay thing to go after him and continue to do so. No, that's right. I remember... When I was working in the White House, 
there was this constant media narrative that President Trump was a very poorly informed decision maker because he wasn't reading his briefing books. And I always thought that was so funny because it's like, this is a man with enough sense to know that the briefing books are prepared by highly compromised partisan ideologues who hate him and hate his voters. So if he's not reading the briefing books, it's probably because he's getting the information from advisors who are, you know, read up on the issues, but are people he can trust rather than an anonymous giant binder of a thousand pages of irrelevant information that's designed to manipulate him for a doctrine that he uh, was elected to oppose. So I think it, it's clear across a whole host of issues, the institutional opposition that he encountered, and as you point out, why they would have an incentive to try and undermine him uh, and to work against his policy goals. So uh, one other question I had about your your work having, you know, delved so deeply into the details on the intelligence bureaucracy working against the president. Do you see any parallels to the coordinated campaign between the intelligence bureaucracy, Democrats in Congress, and the media working against President Nixon during his second term, a, a president who was elected with an enormous sweeping mandate? I think the only state he lost uh, was Minnesota when he was reelected. <laughs> I mean, I, I get frustrated enough digging into the weeds of, of the Russiagate conspiracy that I, you know, I sometimes groan at myself that sometimes I do this by going back into Watergate. There are so many interesting books revisiting Watergate and how that whole scandal unfolded. And there are many ways in which there are similarities between these two things, including, yeah, I mean, it even down to, um, you know, people thought it was like a really legitimate situation with Nixon. And it turned out that it was this number two bureaucrat at the FBI who was upset at being passed over to head the agency. So he decided to exact enact revenge um, against Nixon. As a result, there were all sorts of violations of the law in DC, you know, grand juries, there were the leaks to completely compromised reporters. Um, you know, it's just, it's interesting that the more things change, the more they, they seem the same. Right. Also, you know, people had always thought that Nixon had done the right thing by sort of letting it all happen. And I think going through that and seeing also some later uh, attacks on presidents of both parties informed why it was so important to fight back against this unaccountable bureaucracy in the last six years. Right. And uh, the similarities between a lot of these, you know, it's almost like I think people who are savvy consumers of this information, they realize that it's to an extent it's a playbook. They run in a way an op, th these intelligence bureaucracies, like they would run a planned operation in a foreign country. They are running an op on the American people, on on elected officials who they do not like and want to compromise. It's really... Oh, Paige, I do want to say, I think it's interesting that the people who fought back against the Russiagate conspiracy, and there were very, very few of us, like, I mean, like, in the reporting community, maybe 10, if you're being super generous, most of... Like, the interesting thing is that somewhere on the left, somewhere on the right, all of them had grown skeptical of, intelli of the intelligence community many decades prior, mostly with the handling of the Iraq war. Mm. And it shows how important it is to understand the history of the CIA and other intelligence agencies. They just have like a real honest uh, assessment of who they are and how they operate and understanding that information operations are a huge part of what they do, that they're run against foreign entities, but also the, the American people. Yes. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. I feel like it used to be a point of pride for far left activists to oppose these shadowy government organizations, these shadowy government agencies. And now they line right up with them saying that these are our, you know, unparalleled heroes of democracy, that we must worship Alexander Vindman and we must worship James Comey because they're the true heroes uh, undermining the duly elected president. And it's just an interesting reversal of loyalties there. They don't even see it as a point of pride to oppose the unaccountable elements of government anymore. More. But um, moving right along, I wanted to get to your book, Rigged. So can you walk through some of the lowest points of what was going on in advance of the 2020 election? I think that one thing that I lament was that President Trump was a lone voice 
out there in 2020 saying you're going to have significant problems with how these elections are run when they are uh, bragging even, you know, it'll take weeks to count ballots, we're changing the laws, all of these types of things. And even, you know, making policy changes to how elections were run in a state like Pennsylvania, the law changes there were completely unconstitutional. They were uh, they, they were doing things that violated the law, violated any understanding of how elections should be run. And so are, can you walk through a couple of the most significant things that were happening in the run-up to the 2020 election and explain the Zuckerbucks issue. Yeah, so I wrote a book on the 2020 election mostly because, you know, people were talking about it so much in the aftermath. Obviously, people were very frustrated with how that election was administered. And I wanted to just understand what had really happened. And I am so glad I ended up writing on it. I, I've, you know, it was very helpful to understand what actually happened, as opposed to some of the conspiracy theories that were out there, you know, left and right, either that you know, there were no problems with the election or that you know Venezuela was controlling things. But to make a very long story short, what happened was Mark Elias led an effort to change hundreds of laws and processes across the country focused on, yes, states that were uh, anticipated to be closer, like Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, you know, um, these these types of states, that those changes were enacted occasionally constitutionally, which means that state legislatures approve it. More often than not, they were done completely outside of that process with like rogue state actors just forcing the changes, using the pretext of COVID to push through all of these changes that Democrats had wanted for decades to make uh, the ballot box sort of less secure. So that was part one. Part two was that one of the world's wealthiest and most powerful men, Mark Zuckerberg, invested literally like $419 million in two left-wing groups to take over government election offices, mostly in the Democrat areas of swing states, to run Democrat get-out-the-vote operations from the inside. I mean, it's now been made illegal in dozens of states, but it was so audacious, like nobody ever dreamed it would be possible to take over government election offices. So nobody had tried. And yet they were able to do it with this massive amount of money. And they did everything from, you know, like registering Democrat voters to ballot trafficking Democrat ballots to curing ballots for Democrat voters. You know, every part of the process was kind of taken over depending on the jurisdiction and to advantage, systematically advantage, Democrat votes in statewide races. It's a great, by the way, way to explain how Republicans increased their House of Representatives total, but lost in the Senate and the presidency. It was this statewide campaign to gin up votes in Democrat areas um, that were already voting Democrat for House races. And there were two other really important things, though, which are recognized by international election observers as problems for election integrity. One is that we moved from a merely biased press into a complete propaganda press that like makes up news, suppresses real news, uh, runs tons of information operations against the American people uh, using their allies in the bureaucracy. And then we also have a weaponized big tech environment that's more powerful than any government on earth that also suppresses information that's disadvantageous to their political allies, that elevates information that they think will help their people, um, you know, through algorithms and, and deplatforming and censorship. And, you know, those two last two groups actually work together to suppress one of the most important stories of the 2020 election, which is about the Biden family corruption. So all of these things contributed to a very bad environment in which to have a free and fair election. Um, and at the end of the day, it came down to like, you know, 40,000 votes across three states. It was a very, very close election. All of those things they did affected, you know, millions of votes when it when it comes to the end of the day. And they were all important. And uh, it was, you know, it's just it's people should have an honest assessment of what actually happened in that election and also why people were so upset about it. But it was a widespread, coordinated effort. Right. Absolutely. And. A couple of things here. One is that as soon as the uh, information, especially things like your reporting about these deliberate 
operations designed to um, help sway elections. As soon as that came to light, the Republican legislatures in a lot of these states immediately snapped into action and said, oh my goodness, this is deeply, deeply improper that this type of stuff was going on. So I think the Wisconsin state legislature, they uh, immediately said, you know, as soon as they could, they made policies against things like the Zuckerbucks type of interventions and things like that. And it's really unfortunate that I, uh, whether it was due to media complacency that they weren't fully reporting on exactly what this type of charitable quote unquote money was doing uh, in the run up to the election, what, whatever, for whatever reason it was that Americans were left in the dark about this type of thing uh, going on, this Mark Elias led, uh, you know, overhaul of how these types of elections were being run in key states, I. Uh, it's unfortunate that we were only able to react post facto when it seems like that's something that the RNC, the the establishment Republican apparatus, uh, what are they doing with all those billions and millions of dollars that people donate to them if they're not monitoring these types of things to say, can half of the country still have a voice when we go to the uh, go to the polls and select the candidate we're voting for? Uh, it's to me incredible so- neglect that our party apparatus, was not monitoring for these things, was not worried about these things, just kind of left it to chance and left left President Trump to flap in the wind as a lone voice saying there's going to be something really problematic going on. So I actually, I mean, I think it's more complicated than that. So first off, it's actually not true that they weren't fighting before the election. It is true that both the RNC and the Trump campaign should have been doing a lot more earlier to fight some of these changes. It's also true that, unfortunately, and I've talked to so many people, you know, so many bright, intelligent people on the Trump campaign or in the RNC or elsewhere, they really, and this is at the state level, at the national level, they really didn't understand the Zuckerberg operation until after it was over. So they didn't even know how to fight it because they didn't quite understand what was going on. And the Zuckerberg operation was really savvy. They gave small grants to Republican counties. They gave massive grants to Democrat counties, but people didn't understand how much funding was going and how it was deployed in a way to systematically advantage Democrats. So they didn't know if they should be fighting it or trying to get some of the more of the funding. You know, it was a very confusing time. Um, but also, I actually just have been working on a story about how much has been done in the last two years by, you know, everyone. It's kind of a weird coalition of both establishment Republicans and grassroots, you know, MAGA type Republicans to begin to restore integrity to the elections. Um, one of the things I was shocked by when I reported the book, I couldn't even believe this was real. And I'm sure you know this because of your background, but Republicans were prohibited from doing election day oversight for nearly 40 years. They had been um, like sued in the early 1980s over how they handled an election in New Jersey. And as part of the settlement agreement, they were barred from doing the the entire RNC was barred from doing election day oversight or litigation, almost all of it. Um, And they were kept under that consent decree for literally nearly 40 years. The judge who put them under it was only a federal judge for like 15 years. But then he took senior status, which allows you to keep certain cases after you retire for like another 21 years. It took him literally dying for the Republicans to get out from under the agreement. And it was so sensitive that Democrats tried to keep it in there because like in 2016, Sean Spicer was reportedly on, you know, the fourth floor of Trump Tower when he was supposed to be on the fifth floor. And they were like, well, this is a clear violation. So we need to keep them under this consent decree. And the replacement judge, who himself was a total, you know, lib, was like, this is absurd. And he finally let them out of it. So by the 2020 election, they had only just been let out of this. They're just trying to get their, like, figure out what's going on. There had never been, like, good coordination. Well, in the last two years, I mean, obviously, donors and voters were angry at how little had been done in 2020. And they were demanding accountability. It's like, I was I was just interviewing people about this and they were saying it's like a totally new um, approach taken by the RNC. They are aggressive with litigation. They will sue over small things, big things. They've had successes in just making sure like, you know, what an example of a small thing might be making sure you have an equivalent number of Republican poll watchers as Democrats. 
they sue over big things, like they just had a big win in Pennsylvania about how undated ballots cannot be counted since that violates the law in Pennsylvania. It's like a, it's just a different world. So you got the RNC working on it, the NRCC, NRSC. You also have a new, like big legal group that would kind of be like an Elias Law Group that is also involved in this called Restoring Integrity and Trust in Elections. You have the Honest Elections Project. You have other groups that have been around for a while, like Public Interest Legal Foundation. Um, You have an election integrity network that is trained literally tens of thousands of poll workers and poll watchers to just be present, both for early voting and election day voting, to just monitor the situation. And And just having people around, which is something that didn't really happen in 2020 because of COVID rules or otherwise. Just having people around makes it so that people are less likely to engage in shenanigans. So there is a lot of reason. I mean, I'm not saying it's like the situation is solved. For one thing, only Republican states really worked to improve election integrity. You mentioned Wisconsin, but the Democrat governor twice vetoed election reforms there because he knew how helpful to the Democrats, having things like Zuckbox are. Um, so there's a lot that remains to be done, but there's also a lot of reason to be optimistic. And if Republicans do well on Tuesday night, they really need to give credit to this movement for all the work they did in a very short period of time. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I, I don't mean to overgeneralize. I think the point I was trying to make is that it was very difficult to anticipate how some of these, you know, quote unquote, charitable things, uh, how those donations were going to be used, how this stuff was going to be used as, you know, mechanisms to help the Democrats. Because when you you can't be watching every single charity, every single, you know, d- little donation that Mark Zuckerberg makes, because you, you're not anticipating that it will be used as this like clandestine get out the vote operation for Democrats. So I'm just, it, what I'm lamenting is the lack of, uh, scrutiny that that type of thing was receiving at the time because it was very difficult to anticipate how exactly it was going to affect things. Um, I think the the uh, primary takeaway is that um, and a, a thread running through all of this from the FBI and Mark Elias to Mark Zuckerberg and so on is that dirty tricks are not just for political actors. And it's unfortunate that this is uh, metastasizing to other uh, elements that you wouldn't typically expect, whether it's a government bureaucracy or a, a quote unquote charitable donation. Um, it, it's a- Paige, I do want to also mention, you know, the 2016 Russia collusion hoax was really built around this idea that because Russians did what they always do and have done for literally 100 years of, of uh, trying to interfere in elections, like most countries try to interfere in each other's elections, that by spending $100,000 in Facebook ads, some of which benefited Hillary Clinton, some of which benefited Donald Trump, that that meant that the election had been stolen. And so the same media, the same media that pushed this idea that $100,000 in Facebook spending, again, that benefited both sides is like the end of democracy, but somehow 419 million dollars in election meddling funds to systematically advantage one party is like nothing worth reporting about. It's insane. It's just an example of their corruption. And you know that if there were an alternate universe where a right wing billionaire could do such a thing, I mean, they couldn't. But if there if if that had happened, you know, they'd be covering it nonstop every day. And I'm really glad you brought up that point, not just because the uh, the proportion the proportional impact is so outrageous uh, relative to the coverage and the the perspective that the media takes on those types of uh, activities, but also that the, as you point out, other countries will do things or even say they've done things to cast doubt and, and create, you know, cast aspersions, delegitimize election outcomes. That's just what they do because they like to, uh, they like to look at the United States and sort of delegitimize whatever we're doing um, and and to create doubt amongst the populace and what's going on. But then I look at the way Joe Biden says, oh, we we may not be able to uh, have the results of the election for some days or weeks or whatever it is. And it's like, how how does that type of language help out, help restore faith that Americans believe that their their vote will be counted properly, that their elections are being conducted properly. And that was an enormous red flag to me in 2020 when they were saying, oh, don't be alarmed if um, it looks like a red mirage. You've got a, a lot of Republican ballots, but then a couple weeks later, you're going to have a, a blue <laughs> tsunami. You know, how does that make sense? Like that to me sounds like a, a 
uh, almost well, a foreign again, intelligence opt. <laughs> Paige, if you if you look and read what international election observers have long said about how to know when an election is valid or not, one of their criteria was if it takes a really long time to reveal results, that's not a good sign. And I understand that the left has all their explanations for why there is this like under the cover of dark of night like mysterious ballot counting things happening. And, you know, that's what mail-in balloting really does provide them, a means by which to do these late drops in, um, in, in more controlled fashion. But you wouldn't feel like you could trust a football game where the referees went off the field and came back like two weeks later and said, okay, so we tallied up the po- the points and we made rulings and it turns out, you know, the Cowboys won or whatever. You wouldn't trust that, particularly if the Cowboys were employed by you know, or if the referees were employed by the Cowboys themselves. And so it's not unreasonable for people to lose trust in elections where there is a lot of opacity and and delays. And so um, one of the other things Democrats are doing right now is like really fighting this movement to have poll watchers there. But if they really wanted elections to be trusted, if they really cared about democracy, that is like the most wonderful thing you can have is participation, transparency, accountability, and citizen, yeah, citizen interaction with this. Like, there's something really weird about how every election reform or practice that brings transparency or accountability or security is fought by Democrats. It's like, it just, it just seems kind of suspicious. Like, why do you not want accountability or security here? And I thought um, it was really reprehensible when Georgia was trying to uh, tighten up their election laws uh, last year. And th- under duress from the Democrats, you had all these corporations like Major League Baseball and I think it was Coca-Cola and these other ones um, trying to coerce their preferred policy outcomes with it was it was a form of extortion they were saying we will leave your state if you make laws that we disagree with and of course they have a right to do that but i just wanted in my mind it was so improper that obviously they were reacting to these election laws that the policymakers in Georgia felt they had a duty to their citizens and to their state to fix some of these really dysfunctional election procedures and these corporations again, under duress from the Democrats, felt entitled to try and coerce the policy outcomes that they preferred to usurp the system and say, don't make that law. We will impoverish your state by depriving you of business. And to me, if you want to affect uh, policy outcomes in that way, maybe the CEO of Coca-Cola should be running for office. Maybe the CEO of the Major League Baseball organization should be running for office. Not trying to usurp uh, the democratic process in that way. It was just really, really, in my mind, lowbrow and repelling that they felt entitled to do that. But um, yeah, it actually was an attack on democracy itself. <laughs> you, could, you could say <laughs> I'm still not watching baseball and I was a lifelong baseball fan, huge, huge baseball fan. And I cannot watch because I'm so disgusted that when Joe Biden told them to boycott the free state of Georgia, they said, sir, yes, sir, we'll do whatever you want. We will go against the people of Georgia. And it was all over an election integrity bill that frankly wasn't even that impressive. Right. I mean, it was like some minor improvements. They have a long way to go. And all the lies told by Democrats and the media uh, are being exploded. Like they said it was a voter suppression bill. Yes. Georgia's on track to have record turnout for a midterm election. More black people, more white people, more young people, more old people, more men, more women. Everyone is voting, finding it easy to vote. And they, you know, and this is with some like minor improvements in their process. Yes. And it was, I mean, the way they were smearing the people of Georgia, the legislators of Georgia, it, it was really reprehensible, calling them racists, calling them, you know, Jim Crow 2.0. That was really, really reprehensible. I want to turn quickly to another thing, which is the potential future election manipulation efforts. And I, I think that you raised a really good point which is that uh, the Republican apparatus has been responding in kind. They have heard uh, the enormous grassroots outcry of, you know, please do something about this. But there's something coming down the pike that's a little bit concerning. And you recently wrote a piece on the Biden plan to federalize local elections by sort of misusing public money and repurposing some federal agency uh, powers basically to turn them into Democrat get out the vote operations. Can you explain a little bit about what you've uncovered there? 
Yeah, one of the signature goals of the Democrats in after they won all these 2020 elections was to pass HR1, which was this plan to federalize elections and kind of do what they did in 2020 on a federal scale. And kind of amazingly, they were unable to get that passed. At the same time that they put put forth that legislation though, Joe Biden issued an executive order to have all you know, what is it, five or 600 federal agencies come up with plans to involve themselves in the election process, which is itself a viol- you know, that's a violation of our constitution. Election administration should be handled by the states. Um, it's also just kind of immoral to tie people's welfare benefits to, to election activities. Um, there's a form of coercion there that is improper. And it is something that does systematically benefit Democrats, and that's why Democrats did it, to uh, to take like groups that they're very likely to have an advantage with, such as college students or something like that. Um, now, the executive order required everyone to turn their plans in to the White House by September of 2021 and to turn those plans over to Susan Rice, who's the domestic policy head. And so when that deadline passed, a bunch of good government groups said, okay, show us the plans. And nearly every agency has completely stonewalled and fought efforts to reveal what's going on. This is a thing that makes me nervous, by the way. It reminds me a lot of 2020 where nobody quite understood the Zuckerberg operation. Well, nobody quite understands what these federal agencies are doing, and they are violating even court orders to keep it secret. So the Department of Justice has been sued by multiple groups to reveal what their plan is. A court required them to turn over information. They refused to turn over some of the key information. And they're just like, they, they've they always been having this plan to wait until after the midterms to release it. And co- the court was like, you can't do that. Well, they're doing it. The election is coming up in a few days and they have succeeded in it. And so when President Biden gives a speech about how if you in any way challenge an election result, that makes you worse, the worst person in the world, it kind of makes me nervous. Like it's not a speech you give as you're about to be completely wiped out in midterm elections. It's the kind of speech you give when you run a 2020 style operation, right? So I'm like, what is their plan? What are they doing? And I don't, you know, I've I've really tried to figure out exactly what all of the methods are. I don't think it will be sufficient to to turn around their prospects on, on election day, but we really won't know for a few months. That's right. Well, I'm really glad you're reporting on it because I think that it highlights a couple of things. Number one, that when they didn't get what they want by trying to pass legislation through Congress with HR1, the what was it, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, uh, mm-hmm. they, uh, they're they trying to do this through um, completely unaccountable government agencies and, and running this through the White House. I think that... Um, a lot of the, a lot of those communications probably uh, are protected from being FOIAed, or they're doing they're able to do it in a more clandestine way if they're running it through Susan Rice, um, and whatever it is. It, clearly, as you said, if even when they're being you know ordered by courts to uh, share with the public what exactly they're up to, they're refusing, and so. I, I couldn't agree more. It's really concerning. And to your point, it's really difficult to know how these mechanisms are going to um, affect outcomes when the the exact way in which they are working is not totally clear. So um, I want to be respectful of your time. I have one more question here, which is, in your mind, what should some of the GOP's top priorities be uh, if they have a mandate, uh, if they take over the House and Senate after Election Day, and uh, your thoughts on impeaching Joe Biden? So historically, I think Republican voters have been frustrated because they will put Republicans in power and then they do very little with that power. And it is such a long practice that they I worry that Republican elected officials think they can get away with it again. I don't think they understand how deeply concerned and upset Americans are about what has happened to the country. And they are looking for big action, something to fight back against this destruction of the country. And so I think It'll depend on whether they have both the House and the Senate, but even just having the House will be will be a game changer in Washington. The last two years of uniparty control have been very destructive to the country. So I would just say, first and foremost, like 
using that oversight capability, one of the things that even as Congress has turned over all of its authority to this unaccountable administrative state, they still have oversight authority and they should use that as much as possible. I would say they should get going on massive accountability operations leading to impeachment operations for both. Uh, I mean, I think Merrick Garland needs to be stopped. He's trying to destroy the country. He's achieving it. And he's had no pushback from anyone. They need to They need to stop that right now. Like we won't have a country if we have much more of this two standards of justice. And then I know there's also a lot of interest in impeaching Mayorkas because of how he has violated his oath to the constitution by what's happening on the border. And I think, you know, historically impeachments of presidents haven't gone so well for the party that does the impeachment. President Trump was far and away more powerful after the Ukraine impeachment hoax. I mean, he was on track for victory, which is why everything had to happen in 2020 to make sure that he would not win re-election. It didn't work well for Republicans when they did it with Clinton. Um, and I know there's probably a lot of interest in impeaching Biden, but I think that if you're actually just caring about results, you can get all of the benefit with with almost none of the downside by going after the people who actually don't have dementia, who are destroying the country um, as cabinet heads. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, thank you. I think that um, it, it's incredible to see just how Biden has self-immolated in a way by, again, I, I don't like to... Uh, I don't subscribe to the who's really running things narrative because I, I think that Joe Biden is has enough wherewithal to know that he basically made an agreement with really, really, really destructive actors to let them uh, run away with things. And he's content to do it because he has wanted to be president his entire life. And so I don't let him off the hook. But uh, in terms of impeachment strategically, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, Molly Hemingway, it has been such a delight to have you on. I cannot thank you enough for the really, really important reporting that you do, the research you do uncovering how these issues affect our country and affect the people. So thank you for joining This Is Your Country. Thank you, Paige. 